Hello and welcome to another very special episode here on Viking TV with me, Anne Diamond. Now today I'm in the south of England. I'm in uh, Dorset, in fact in a little village called Durweston, which is very special because it's a very amazing place. And I'm here to meet an amazing man. And I use that word advisedly because he is the king of mazes. He has built the most fantastic mazes you've ever seen, some of the most famous mazes you've ever seen, and he's doing weird and wonderful things taking the whole genre forward. But for the moment, I'm in his garden and it's a maze. So my big problem is going to be actually finding him. Adrian Fisher, you are the maze master. You're the king of the mazes. You've designed mazes all over the world. You are the go-to person for maze design. But where did it even start? What got you interested in mazes? Well, I was, I grew up on, in fact, I'm, here we are sitting in De Weston, which is a little village in North Dorset, right beside the River Stour. And I grew up 30 miles downstream in the back of Bournemouth. And in the garden, I built a hedge maze, as you do. Well, as a as a child, as a child. No, I was more you know in my early twenties yeah. when I built it. But I was, but we used to play in the gardens, and I, I built numerous tree houses and rope bridges and you know rafts and things like that because mm. we were down by the river. And um, when I was at school, I, I I was designing little card games on you know on bits of the back end of uh, cereal packets, you know, sort of little um, cops and robbers game. And I was designing this Cops and Robbers game in, in a Latin class. And Mr. Corbett spotted I was. And he tore it just in half. I thought he was very merciful. Mm. Because then I was able to Put take the two together. bits together and yeah. I could continue. He's, although he didn't approve of me not attending to my Latin class, he nevertheless didn't crush my spirit. Mm. Good man. Mm. Anyway, so even then I was being a bit out of hand. Anyway, bit by bit, I tried various things. I went to Australia for a year after school, and it was travel around and learned a bit about the world. And I tried to, you know, become an accountant, which was really most well. If I had succeeded, I'd have been a very boring person. Anyway, I don't know. I think chartered accountants are fascinating people, but I wasn't going to be one of yeah. them. And um, anyway, I was fascinated by productivity and industry and things like that. And all the time at school, I mean, you know, we used to build all sorts of things at school. Um, so, I went into work study, and it was fascinating, terrific. Uh, I worked. At, I was taught by the great Sam Fryer, who pioneered the whole logical way of building liberty ships in America, and showed them how to use productivity to really make the war effort reliable and consistent, and mass volume and to deadlines. And after that, he came over to. England and taught lots of people in ICI about productivity and by the time I came across him he was teaching about productivity in Dickinson Robinson so I went to Bristol for six weeks and I learned all about productivity, productivity and method study and work measurement and how to really you know and the great message I learned was don't try a little bit harder at the wrong method stand back change the method completely so that can do it in a fraction of the time and then apply that method lavishly allowing yourself that extra time to reflect to get it even better so it doesn't go wrong rather than trying an old method like keeping on running steam engines at 250 miles an hour until they break up and nobody quite knows how you can make it any faster but we all have to try harder and one day it'll get better when it won't so you're learning about you're training your brain in productivity efficiency yes. but you've still got a brain that that loves puzzles and 
and physically building things as well. Yeah, yeah. So at some stage, those two aspects of your brain got together and thought about building a maze. Well, I thought, you know, here I was with, in ITT headquarters doing great things to do with productivity and cost benefits and all that, and three-year capital paybacks. And I thought, you know, it's like if I wasn't here within three months, it's like a stone thrown into a storm. You, know, whatever. you wouldn't be able to see a ripple in a few seconds if all three months they'd never remember. Is that really why I'm here? And I thought, wouldn't it be great to travel the world like a Johnny Appleseed of mazes going around, creating mazes everywhere. Um, and I thought, there's all these castles, chateaus, palaces all over Europe. That's got to be the market. Mm, and that's how you've ended up. No, 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 I didn't, you see. I thought, this is the market. And then I started thinking, well, how can I get from here to there? Because you've got to, the day you leave, you've got to have a full-time, full-on revenue stream yes. or you're in trouble. Yes. And there was no way. So I was rather good at photocopying machines. So I got really good at improving photocopying efficiency by 40% savings. So I thought, right, I'm one plank. I'm going to be good at photocopying consultancy all over. And I did quite a lot of big... To bring in the money. Bring, yeah, you know, gets cash flow, you know, mm. per day. It was great, you know, big accountancy firms, law firms, engineering firms, consulting. So I did that. And then the other half was cultivating the mazes. So you'll find some of my earlier mazes were all very close to ITT factories. <laughs> Funnily enough. I used to ring up Lord So-and-so and say, um, I'm in the district. I wonder if I could come and talk to you. He said, when will we be here? I said, could I come at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock? Well, make it snappy because we've got dinner at 7. You'll have to go by then, but you can have a glass of sherry and tell me what you want to talk about. And so quite a few of my earlier hedge mazes and things were close to ITT factories because yeah. it took me around the country. Very difficult when you've only got a few weeks pay, you know, paid leave each year. But gradually, um, I managed to make it sort of full, build full a reputation, time. Yeah. And then ra rapidly, I discovered that once you've got one castle in a maze, uh, you don't need a second one. You, no, not for 400 years, you know, because Hampton Court's only 300 years old, you know, the Hampton Court maze. And then the next thing I found to my dismay was that once you've built a maze, no other castle wants to build one within 50 miles because it's too close. Mm, so you that's what in the end took you around the world, I suppose. Well, partly then I realised that it wasn't just historic properties. It was theme parks. It was mm. zoos. And I also learned, actually, that it's not to do with um, whether their castle is close to another one. It's whether the person is absolutely passionate about mazes and puzzles and entertaining their visitors and giving families something to do. And in fact, it gradually distilled that the point of a maze is to have a lovely time doing something completely bonkers and out of your normal, familiar routine. And you go in with loved ones, it might be holding the hand of a sweetheart, you might be going with mum, dad and your brothers and sisters or whatever, and you have a little adventure. And the more mm. you go around, the, uh, the maze excites you and challenges you to solve challenges on the way. So, you know, you might put a finger maze in the halfway round to play with, or you might have a little quiz trail to solve. And if you find all the 12 different parts of the quiz trail, you'll know the whole story of, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the twin brothers who caught the um, golden mouflon. So let's go to, go to the sort of definition. What is a maze? And what's the difference between a maze and a labyrinth? Well, labyrinths were single thread paths that started 4,000 years ago. And uh, so there were no choices. It was a single path. You, you find them in the Baltic. There's 600 of them on the shores of the Baltic Sea. Um, no choices. And you put, you know, to the middle. Um, mazes only popped up about 400 years ago. Yes, the oldest one in Britain, I think, is the Hampton Court maze, isn't That's it? the oldest surviving mm. hedge maze, mm. but it wasn't the earliest, because the, it's the Italian Renaissance that started. They tried to recreate. I see Pliny in um, the, the first century AD lived, was the governor in Tongaran, and he described the mosaic labyrinths inside, under cover, underneath the pan tiles, because the mortar would have washed away if it had been open to the sky. Yes. And he also talked about low boxes, box bushes, it's not to do with box, box-like hedges at all. It's Buxus, the plant. Yes. And he was describing little Buxus parterres laid out in the courtyards. So they had them then. So, now, he was talking about two different things. When it came to the Renaissance, everyone in their wisdom... I mean, you have the dream of Polyphilus in 1599, where this monk described this journey of Poly, uh, Polya. Who, uh, Polyphilus searching, the lover of Polya, searching for Polya for three years. He was all over the Aegean and the Mediterranean trying to find her 
and in the end it discovered that the true meaning of the thing was not scientific accuracy or um, you know technical merit or anything like that or uh, it was the middle door of three was love and he opened the door and there after three years was his girl Polly. Yeah. Took him three years to get to her. It took five, three years to hear. He went to all sorts of adventures and horrible things. Yeah. Anyway, when they came to it, this is, by the way, from Tongara. This is a 12-sided piece, which is, um, I think, a centurion's gambling uh, thing. You put a ball in it, and if it tips out, you win, and if yeah. it tips out, the centurion keeps the profits. Um, anyway, the, when they, the Italian Renaissance, they, they mistakenly thought that the two things were one. Hmm. So they put them so together. they started putting together hedge mazes, but they were in the shape of labyrinths. Yes, I see. So the old mosaic Using labyrinths box. with straight, yeah, well, not necessarily box. It hmm. could have been other materials, but whatever grows locally. And there is no magic. It depends on the climate. Hmm. And then gradually from that, they they designed it. So the earliest labyrinths, uh, the, the earliest hedge mazes, had no junctions and choices at all. Ah. They were labyrinths, they were one route. Yeah, they were a pattern of a labyrinth, mm. but laid out in hedges. But they yeah. discovered that you could then hide junctions. And if a gap through, you know, you could hide and wriggle. So they were great for courting, culturally intrigue and all kinds of things. Yes. Um, and they're very romantic for some reason, oh, aren't they? Oh, everything. I mean, I, I designed the hedge maze in the latest film, Saltburn, which, um, you know, they, they, it was quite fun because we actually designed the whole maze for real. And it's been created completely artificially in CGI. How do you design them then? Because so many of them are different. The ones you've done over the years have different outward shapes, at mm. least. Uh, you've done one in the shape of a foot. Um, but, uh, and in the, uh, well, like actually, a that was my partner, engine. Randall, who right. did that. Yes. A steam engine one, I think. Uh, I mean, in, in all sorts of shapes and, yes, yes, and yes. sizes. But what do, you, how, do you have a computer software that does it for you? Or do you do, you do it on, yourself on grid, grid paper? Well, I, I tend to sketch it out to start with pencil and paper. Um, the early days, we used to use grids of squared paper. Um, but I, I put it on the computer in the end because it's quicker. And then you can do various versions yeah. and iterations and things. And you can change a design of just change one or two junctions and you've got a perfect next version. Yes. And, and as you say, you, can somet you sometimes put puzzles along the way. Anything to keep people... Interested. Well, I'm thinking or of the visitor puzzled. experience. Yeah, minute, moment by moment, you go through it. What are you going to be doing? But I don't know which order you're going to do. You may come across certain things like a sundial three times. Mm -hmm. You might miss something else completely, which is. And is there always, or at least in a traditional maze, is there always the sort of beautiful tower or some little building in the middle? No, not really. Um, you can do what you want. If it's a labyrinth, you'd have got no need to hide the junk, the path. So it's often a flat grass and flat stone or whatever. And so you might put a mosaic in the middle or a sundial or something visible, a pillar. Whereas if you've got a hedge maze, then it's more fun because it's all verticals. And then to make the, the, the goal exciting, you want to be able to get up even higher. So we go up in a tower and you look from the view. Hmm. And it's amazing how you go up just 14 feet and the view is completely It changes different. the perspective entirely. Yeah. In fact, you were telling me just a few minutes ago that if only you'd had drone cameras um, 40, 30 years ago, <laughs> yeah. you would have seen, you'd have been able to see your mazes from on high, from the sky, yes. which you've not been able to do until recently. Absolutely not. Well, I mean, there was always, uh, you know, light aircraft. I mean, when I was building corn mazes in America, we used to, you know, every other farmer had a his own little uh, light, light Cessna or something, and we'd go up and... They're quite good because you can take the top win top of the window um, perspex window upwards and duct tape it to the wing before you take off, mm. and then you can get a perfect shot without anything in the way from your lens, and you decide which side you're going to look out the window, and from there you can get good shots at angles of what you've taken. That must be tremendously satisfying for you, <laughs> having designed it and, and watched the builders yeah. build it. You're still thinking, I wonder what it looks like from the air, and then at last you do see that it's turned out it. perfectly. And then I mean. You learn a lot about aviation. I mean, uh, I remember I did one wonderful one in the shape of a, an English halfpenny bit uh, in 1995. It was in gigantic um, Golden Hind, you know, the old half halfpenny used yeah. to have this. And I wanted to get it spot on. You see, now I worked with this, this was George Gerster, was a great Swiss photographer, and he did the photography for this. And he was absolutely incredible at getting really good shots spot on. And I didn't know how he did this. So we had this, in this case, a helicopter. And so I saw we got along and we're shooting along. And I said, could you now hold it there? And I want to get it absolutely square on, just up a bit. Or... I'm not sure we should be doing this, Sage, and it's a very humid day. 
and suddenly the, we dropped out the sky. Mm -hmm. We had chewed up, luckily we're starting at 800 feet, but we chewed up all the air underneath it. Mm. And so it was not able to support us. It was just like the Bermuda Triangle where you put bubbles up and the, and the ships sink because there's yeah. not enough So you nearly sink. landed in your own maze. And we dropped 600 feet. Oh, crumbs. And as, as we were dropping, he then started tilting forward and he just wanted to drive his way out of this column of disturbed air yeah. before we got down too low. Who would have thought? And afterwards he told me what, what had been going on. Well, he was the pilot and I just trusted he knew what he was doing. But yeah. But, oh. He said, I really don't ask me to stop again. No. And I thought, you know, I no idea about this, but it does help explain the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Oh, do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> now, and I've been flying drones now for nine years, and I'm on Air Force Three at the moment, you know, which is a great little thing. But um, it's, you know, you, what I found fascinating, we live in a wonderful world where all sorts of wonderful things about science and uh, technology and people and what you can do with you don't have to have the latest technology but it's what you do with it that's so powerful mm. um, that can get out some wondrous things and the people you meet and the people you choose to spend your time with and the kind of love that you put into it, all the relationships and the you know the, the before that the older you get the more time you have in life to make mistakes so by the time you get to you know our sort of age if you like um the um You've had more time to make mistakes, you've learnt more, you've seen more, hopefully you haven't made more mistakes or the same mistake too many times, you know, but you have different mistakes. But you learn, you grow, and you're stronger for it, as long as it doesn't destroy you completely. And, um, no, but you're doing something you absolutely love. Well, yeah, Monday's one I mean, of the best days of my week. You know, yeah. I don't know about you, Monday's a good day. Yeah, um, leads but... to the rest of the week, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Let me talk about specific mazes. Um, a lot of uh, people will know, of course, you did the maze at Blenheim Palace which is one of the most famous mazes. Yeah. Um, it's a heck of a responsibility because it's such a historic place. And you know that many, many people are going to go to that maze. What was the, uh, and, I mean, did they commission you to do a particular design or did you go away and think about it yourself? Well, I was, uh, that's one of 15 mazes I designed with Randall Coach. Um, he was about 30 years my senior. And uh, he was the most char wonderful character. He'd, um, I mean, we designed that one together, and in fact, it is on the wall there. Um, uh, it's it both is a picture of um, what Blenheim Palace is all about, mm -hmm. and and it's also a puzzle maze and full of symbolism. Um, and we, in that case, we went to the around the palace, and I mean, you know, the idea was we want to create a maze that's going to be really compelling and interesting. So it's going to be fun because you play with it, but that's like just judging ice skating by technical merit. Mm. It's got to have artistic yes. impression. Yeah. So the next one, in fact, it should be the third dimension of spiritual excitement and fulfilment and all this, you know. But anyway, we went round and we noticed on the top of the um, palace there were stone carvings by Grin and Gibbons of the English lion mauling the French cock. Ah. Now, nothing subtle here, you know. Yeah. And it's based on the victory at the, of the Battle of Blenheim by the Duke, First Duke of Marlborough. Yes. So we've got to celebrate that. So if you look at the design, you've got tremendous trumpets and banners and yes. the panoply of victory yes. as done in stone by Grin and Gibbon. He didn't just carve in wood, but also stone. And then we all in the middle, we have a cannon with a sort of, you know, cannon with the wheel of a cannon, you know, so yes. with Blenheim on it. Yes. In fact, you'll see that in the centre of the Five pound note is that little bit is appears. Yes, very yeah, well I, done. I got a royalty from the Bank of that, England for that. Did you? Oh indeed? yeah. And then um, the the cannon firing and little stacks of cannonballs in the foreground. Yes. And then because we, 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 uh, Churchill was there, um, V for victory because he was born in. He Blenheim was born Palace, in Blenheim. Born yeah. in Blenheim Palace. And so you have this wonderful sort of exuberance of uh, of, uh, of Blenheim. Yes. And that's in the walled garden. So you, that tapestry shows it with the walled garden around the end. And, um, is it very difficult to get in and out? I mean, you know it, don't you? You would know not, how to get out. Well, it's not the biggest in the world. I mean, yeah. uh, <laughs> I did this one in China, which is, uh, was it, <laughs> 33,000 square metres in area and 8.38 kilometres of path. The total path length is 8.38 kilometres. So if you got really lost and you were going round and round and get, trying to get out... No, no, the Chinese are very competitive. Yeah. And, no, no, this one didn't phase them at all. Um, I did one in Christchurch in Bournemouth, which was uh, 19 and a half acres and wow. 
nine and a half miles of paths. And 60% of the people who went there solved the whole lot. Is that right? Yeah, they people took are about two and a half, they three hours. And they yeah. seem to... I mean, but said, we had ways of getting out more easily, quick exits at half points. And... I mean, we've always, for some reason, been totally fascinated by mazes, <laughs> haven't we? The one at Leeds Castle you mm. did too, and that's a beautiful maze. Yeah. Well, we worked with Vernon Gibbard, who was an architect, and he was working with Diana Raynell, who did all the interior um, eight shells. And she was an absolutely brilliant grotto creator, and she brought a whole team of people in for five months to decorate this grotto inside the... I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. It's it is. It's finest. quite weird, isn't yeah. it? Um, she later went on to restore the one at Payne's Hill as well. Um, and Vernon had come up with this fantastic idea of the tower in the middle and a, an, a, an underground tunnel so that when you left the maze, um, you never saw anybody getting out. So you got to the goal, yeah. but there was no one having to make their way out. At the Hampton Court Palace, you get there, and after you've got to the middle and everything, it's as long an ordeal to get out again. Yes. Now, I believe that the best chariot race is at the end of the Ben Hur, not halfway through. Mm. So you really want a quick exit. So nearly all our mazes have quick exits. Yeah. In fact, I went back to Longleat and changed the design so that they could have a. You quick did the one at Longleat. No, as I well. didn't. No, oh. no, that would have been there before my time. Oh, but, I see. But you but went and I put a quick it. exit in mm. because then it cut out half the frustration. Yes. Well, you know, you had to entertain. You, you people should leave just before they had enough. Yeah. And then they bless you and they. They feel good towards yeah, you. Yeah. So it's a game of chess, you know, you play all your moves, but you must lose, and you must lose just before they've had enough. The amazing thing about uh, your mazes is that they're all unique, mm. aren't they? Because you don't want to do the same thing again. If you were asked to do another maze, you wouldn't just go back to the uh, to one you've done before. You want them to be unique and different. Well, I do. Um, there are certain things that, you know, sometimes come up, like the idea of the Pentagon or... The idea of decoration or whatever. I mean, for instance, this this blob here. Yes, that's um, Pentagon. Has inspired me to do a project I'm going to do. Imagine dropping a, a blob into a glass of milk, and all the milk yes. comes up with you little would... balls on top, yeah. like a coronet. Yes, yes, just like a coronet. What a lovely hmm. idea! How will you use that? I can't say much more because oh. it's rather special. But that came up. As a, in the last couple of weeks as an idea. I mean, we've talked about hedge mazes and you've done paving mazes um, with water features, but now you're really going lavish. You do water mazes mm. and mirror mazes particularly. Um, again, that takes an awful lot of design. And, and the other thing about your water mazes, which lots of fountains, mm. is that you're not just dealing with water that it's not two-dimensional it's not even three-dimensional it takes in time as well it's got the dimension of time so the design changes. so if you imagine you're in a, a kind of water maze with all the walls up and you and your um, twin sister decide to go into the maze your twin may go ahead of you and follow and every single it's like a kind of more a, a bus of dryness so she's a little cocoon of dryness mm. three cells long and then the next cell drops and lets her forward and then the one behind closes up and soon if you stood still your sister is a separate cocoon to you Ooh. and now she is led by that cocoon round the maze and yours hasn't even and now you get another chance to go in a different direction so your cocoon is moving simultaneously uh, in a different circuit now this means that if you have one cocoon which does one loop and then a second cocoon uh, second little bus which intersects like a Venn diagram and then the third one which intersects with the second you have to go into the maze get to a junction point if you like get off the bus and stand at the bus yes. stop watch your cocoon disappear and wait for the new one on the second loop I can understand how you design it ish <laughs> but then that must mean that you have to consult with electrical engineers and water engineers and all sorts of things I mean that must take so much planning um well i mean the great thing is that you have a vision and you then say can i firstly don't you know if you're trying to do something creative you just try and have the wildest ideas that are, but you're trying if always thinking of what's the experience going to be like and what is the notion that is behind it now if the notion is deliciously intriguing like that you think, mm. well, how does that work um that's more fun. I just want to understand how it works. Or I want to walk up to a waterfall which parts and lets me through without getting me yes. wet. And I come out dry. And 
In fact, I, we did one of those at Legoland in Windsor, and I came across this little child dripping wet. Yes, 17! And his mother laughing, and I said, what's going on? He said, um, every time I come here, I try and go through the maze, I go through the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the waterfall, and as I approach, it parts. Yes. But what I do on the other side, it's got no mechanism for letting me come back. So I take a chance. And usually I'm, I get back before it resumes. Mm. Now, by the time I'm off balance, coming back through the waterfall and I notice the gutter changes and lets the water resume, it's too late to escape mm. and I get soaking wet. I've never got done that 17 times before. Wow. Now, I never thought of that as one of the ways to play with yes. it. But if you design something which is open-ended for play, these things can happen. Yeah. And it's not just children who want to play with it either. No, anybody. I mean, we are uh, all fascinated. I remember seeing Lady Brunner. She, she commissioned the Archbishop's Maze at, at Grey's Court, which is a national trust in Oxfordshire. And uh, I remember her grandchildren playing on the maze once. And they were playing a different game. And I just watched them. And mm. then one of them was taller than the others. And they all said, you can't do that. You're not allowed to lean over. And, I don't know. and, then, and bit by bit, they would play a bit and then have a, a debate as to how the rules should be adjusted to make it fair or to make it more yeah and then they carried on and they took and they built up this great big sort of bubble of a world of imagination and cocoon of interplay play in their heads which they all shared mm -hmm. and they played and then it was time for orange and biscuits yeah. and then they never came back and it's the next group unreal. who go along will create a different yes. cocoon yeah a bubble yeah because they, in their minds, responded to what they found. And that is the nature of play. The best kind of play is where you build half a sandcastle, it's time for orange juice, and mm. then you decide that something even more exciting, like, you know, riding a bike or something, is more important than continuing the sandcastle. Because play is not finishing the castle. Play is getting out of the experience of much as castle building as you currently need. You always come back tomorrow, or never. Yeah. Or the tide may come in. It doesn't matter. What's important about play is its recreation. It is truly liberating. What amazing parts of the world have you been to building mazes? Um, well, I've been to America many times. Um, well, you've won awards in America for your mazes, oh, yes. haven't you? Um, I won the Risorgimento Award. That's rather mar amazing thing, this. Um, so in some I've talked to 15,000 people at once in a, an auditorium. They had all these kids, wonderful thing they do, the American youth camps, you know, boot camps and things. Um, the, they, they have a, a gathering together. They all come together and they do creative things, different age groups, different groups, and they all do create, solve different creative problems. And then they display them and they perform them like almost theater. But in fact, you see what's going on. And then, Every year they have a Risorgimento Award for the most, the most, someone who in their field of endeavour has done most. And Velcro Corporation did it, got it one year. The Disney Company got it one year. And I was the first non-American, the first Brit, to win the Risorgimento <laughs> Award for outstanding contributions to the, in, my, in a chosen field of creativity. Well, in fact, you got the MBE here in Britain for the same thing, didn't you? Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, that was a great honour. Yeah. Um, your, your, your cultural contribution. What, how much, if I were a millionaire, yeah. how much would it cost for me to hire you to build me a maze? Is it, and do you charge a fortune? You must do. No, no. Take... oh, actually, I was. I mean, I'm living in this humble little <laughs> studio here in a <laughs> humble corner of Dorset. No, no, no. I mean, the whole thing is. But you are the maze man. You're no, the no, king it, doesn't, of it mazes. doesn't matter. I mean, if somebody says, How much should I spend on a maze? Um, I say, You should try and achieve a three year payback, mm. like you do for a restaurant. Because after three years, everyone will have been there once. And the only reason they're going to get a regular clientele is because they like coming back. And with a maze, it's unlikely. Well, it's not unlikely, but not mm. more than once every three years. The worst is escape rooms, because once you've been to both escape rooms in Bournemouth, you know you've how got to, to escape. go to another city yes. if you want to, you yeah. know. But you have built escape well, rooms. Well, my new product, which is Magic Mysteries, is an escape room for 250 people at a time, simultaneously, with no resetting. That's a lot of people. It's a totally different concept. Mm. That's why there are no escape rooms in theme parks so far.
Yes. But there will be. There will be. There will be. Well, there will and be yours. what you're trying to do is uh, give everybody a unique experience. Yeah. Well, what's the most elaborate maze you've done recently then? Um, and where in the world would it have been? Um, or fun for you? What was the most fun for you? What was the most fun for me? Well, um, I enjoyed, uh, I went out to Ningbo and I created this wonderful, huge maze in China. And uh, funnily enough, I, I had, well, I had Air Force Two. This is, this is my Air Force Two. I had one of these, but I wasn't allowed to take this into China. But when I got there, um, they had an identical Phantom. It's a Chinese, a wonderful thing, these the ch Phantom. And this is so you can... Phantom Four. And I flew it. And I, take I flew, aerial shots I, of what you're I, doing. They, they said, well, here you are, help yourself. So I flew there. Phantom all around the maze and took lovely aerial pictures mm. and videos. And Are you working on a maze at the moment? Yeah, I've got various things on the go, but um, I can't talk yeah, about them. But, uh, oh, but I mean, there are, there are various ones in Dubai and um, Saudi Let's Arabia. Let's have a look at some of the toys you've got here, the little gizmos and gadgets, because all of them mean something rather special to you. I mean, this is fascinating because to me, you explained this to me a few minutes ago. This it, absolutely physically explains the conundrum of finding your way in different right. um, ways. Normally we'd expect a maze to be a series of walls and hedges and, well, sorry, hedges as the walls and grass paths. And, you know, in the hedge maze we have in the garden, you've got a very simple idea. Here, um, we're, we're, it's not us, but this little cube is the thing that's got to get across the maze from this green square to that red one. Yeah. And this is, if you imagine, as a student moving in, this is a box full of books. Yeah. And you can see the, the top of that's it. That's the top, yeah. Is open. And so although I can tilt the box sideways, if I do it upside down, the books fall, books fall out. Yeah. That would be silly, wouldn't it? Yes. So we can't tilt it that way. But we can tilt it any of the other five ways. Right. Now, can we, with that one constraint, that you may not be upside down, and your aim is to get to the red get square. Get to there. And the black squares are the pillars. Within so you can't The walls within, your, within your, uh, mm. your apartment. How can you get from there to there? So one of the things you can do, when you've got four little squares, you can rotate it a bit. When you've got six or eight, or in this case, you can turn around more. Mm. So, so what we do here is you might want to go here, but rather than, we can't go any further that way. If we go that way, we could do that, but we can't go any further that way. But if we go like that, 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 then we can go all the way along as long as we like because it's not tipping out. This allows us then to go upright and over between these two, but I can't go any further. Because you can't. No. Uh, if I go this way, actually, I'll tell you now, that is doomed to failure. It becomes a dead end. What? There's a whole series of moves which would become a dead end. Whatever you do, you, you, you get stuck. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to show you. But that, <laughs> so, like a maze, it's got a, a route. Now that I can go this way. Now I get here. I can't go that way, but I could go upright. And now yes. I'm using my little yes. rotating. I can go sideways, sideways, like that. Yes. But I don't want to go any further. I can't do that because that's the goal. Yeah, it's got because to be it's right got to be up. the right way up. Mm. All right, so I get there. So I now go back on myself, and then I can do my little roll, roll, because the, the side's here. Yes. Now I can rotate back and do that. Actually, I've gone too far. If I go that, then I can do roll, roll that way, upright, and roll the other way. Yes. Now I can go roll, yes, roll, roll, yes, roll. Yes, and yes, yes. Yes, you see. It. <laughs> that is amazing. To me, that actually physically demonstrates the puzzles that you put into everything you do. Um, and you find a way around, you find an amazing way around these walls and the things that mm. are in the way. Uh, what about all, all these things as well? I mean, they look like works of art, but they're rather more than that, aren't well, they? Well, these, these were done... I bought these from an American lady called Bathsheba 25 years ago. She's a most remarkable artist because she worked out how to cast these at a time when they're... Um, well, this is based on a, 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 a four-sided uh, pyramid, yes. a three-sided pyramid, yes. just four faces, and it's totally symmetrical. And it's a continuous piece of... And she she Work. learned she did this by layers and layers of casting, but instead of uh, building, it's not built up like a three D printer. This is way before this. She was building up by layer and layer of the fine particles of metal, mm. and then when she kicked it all out, the metal remained. Amazing. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Absolutely incredible. Uh, I don't know how she did that. That's with a sort of cube. It's got six faces. There. Yes. And this is 
just like that's 12 pentagons make a solid these are 12 stars so they're all star shaped five and 12 of these are utterly symmetrical form this beautiful 12 sided piece and their geometry as art beautiful almost, geometry don't they? and the, the fusion of geometry and art is wonderful and then you've got other i mean you build children's toys oh yes well that, yep. actually I, uh, this is rather fun because um Oscar van der Venter, who's one of the most incredible inventors of puzzles in the world, and um, Weihua, who's an incredible computer programmer, the three of us got together and decided we we're going to do um, a thing called Castle Conquest. Well, I came up with the idea of how you do it. You'd have a, this is a prototype, and this is the better, the final thing. Um, we'd have various art mountains, and there'd be various swamps. You see the blue, blue swamps and the thing. And I, I said to everyone, look, what I want to do is I want to change the length of the... This is the castle, by the way. This is, we can't, you've got to get into the castle mm. somehow. There we are. There's the castle. So you've got to get this uh, siege engine, it looks like a siege engine, over the moat Yes. to get in. And to do that, you have to be there. Now, Oscar came up with this wonderful idea, these bubbles, which means that it's got little dimples, and it means yeah. it... Now, I wanted it so that when it went over, like that, we were over the top of a swamp. Yes. Which you can do, because as long as it's got solid ground on both ends. So you're overcoming obstacles all the way. So, so we, depending on where we put the swamps, we have a 20, 50 different layouts. You start somewhere else, and it takes a number of... It, the shortest one on one of the solutions, over 100 moves. And that's where Weihar did such a grand job on the programming. Anyway, so now I can rotate it sideways. Then I can make it upright. Now... I want to do something else. So what I can do is I can change the height. Uh -huh. That's the innovation. Yes. Change of height. And that's where Oscar was so clever because he came up with the mechanism the of changing you can, height. You yes. just squeeze it. Yeah. And that allows you to do other things. Squeeze it, you see, and it changes height. That's very clever. <laughs> You've had some games actually manufactured, haven't you? Well, this is actually in manufacture. It it's is, going to be it? having a big launch quite soon. Um, and so you have all the different layers. Then I found that we only needed to have 12, four swamps and four mountains, and every single starting position has exactly that number of mountains and swamps, and every single one's a different puzzle, and everyone <laughs> has a unique, fastest solution. What do people think of you when they first meet you? Well, there's a thing called gallery. What does your wife think of you with, with playing with games That's for like you this? to ask her. Well, really. I will have to, yes. You will have to ask her. But uh, I go to, there's a gathering for Gardner, which was in, favor, in, in honor of Martin Gardner. He wrote the, uh, the mathematics, recreational mathematics, Imagine the idea of recreational mathematics. That's what that is. That's what it is, yeah, yeah that's right. It's a strange combination of ideas. Yeah. But anyway, and he wrote this for 40 years in this column, and as a result, every um, year or two, they people from all over the world meet in Atlanta and celebrate. It's called the Gathering for Gardner. And, you know, the top 200 of the leading collectors or creators and inventors of puzzles all get together and meet each other. So we're a terrific fraternity. Yes, I bet. And... Um, and, uh, and, and how many books have you written? Well, I mean, I've done three coffee, got... three coffee table books like that. Um, and uh, I've also done about a dozen different puzzle books and things. But I've got various little booklets. Um, I'm writing one, Aunt Agatha's um, uh, Box of Wonder, um, with Ma uh, Matthew, uh, Ma uh, Matthew McFall. Actually, he's in prison, but he's coming out today. Well, I he goes you... in each day as well, because he he's helps people... <laughs> Achieve uh, all in one. Yeah, that, yeah, like, that okay. explains it better. That explains it. I tell you what, we've looked at a lot of these puzzles yes. and we've talked a lot about mazes, but you've got one in your back garden, which I'd love to see. Can yeah. we go and have a look? Let's go. Yeah. Let's go and have a clay. Right. Let us be amazed. Well, it's rather nice because we've had people from all over the world come to this hedge maze from China, from Chile, from Canada, and they all come here and experience it for real. It's well, in the gardens, you yes. see. Yes, but it's so, what we were saying. For some reason, everybody is fascinated by mazes. Well, the nice thing is it's my, I'm a, I have complete control over the tower, so as I add ex, extra things to it and try things out, it's on the spot, instead of having to go off to some other castle one or two hours away. So this, this this is why we don't use you yeah. the beach very often. Yeah, this, this, is, this beach. is beach. This is beach. It holds yeah. its leaves fairly well. Yeah. But in the last one month a year, it pushes the old leaves off yeah. before the new buds come. Whereas it's through. Whereas the English yew. We have the traditional English yew hedge, 
evergreen. And this is the ultimate queen yes. of all hedge, hedge materials. It is. It's brilliant, isn't in it? In England, anyway. Oh, I love your central tower. This is our, our gold tower. So, in fact, we've come up the quick exit. Normally, you'd come in and solve and it. And find your way and here. And then you've been seeing this tower from a distance. Now, it's eight-sided, and it's got Dorset brick and flint. I mean, it looks positively medieval. It does, doesn't it? This... But you built it. Well, I built this ten years ago, so... This oak door dates back to the early 21st century, i.e. 2013. 20, a couple of years ago. <laughs> 2013. But it looks It nice. looks very old. But notice, if we give children beautiful hardwood oak and things like that, yeah. or everybody, visitors, they really appreciate it, they respond to it. So nothing is done on the cheap. If you want to have a bit of oak, just have less oak, but do it well. Yes, and it adds to the and fantasy. So let's push through yeah. and there Ooh. we go. Ooh. Now, Ooh. Oh, that's not what I expected at all. Woo! Look at that. And so here we have a mirrored chamber, which seems vastly bigger than it is. It seems huge, because it looks yeah. as though it's in a, you're in the middle of a castle yes. that's got depth to it and other areas. But this magnificent spiral staircase. Absolutely, and this is the way up to the top. And like all good games, you have to get people to put themselves out a bit and make a bit of effort. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank this and raise the roof. Raise the roof. Now the reason we do that is we need to keep so we the get, light oh. out so that we have coloured effects in here. The LED lights, they're only a one hundredth of the strength of daylight. Yes. Can look spectacular. Where did you get this incredible stone from? It isn't stone, tap it. <laughs> it's, 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 That's amazing! It's fiberglass. It's what we use in our mirror mazes. I thought that was from an old church or something. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. And this is, a, this is real uh, paving. And those These are your are wonderful shapes again. My geometric shapes, mm. you see. Mm. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to crack this up, and then we can raise the roof yes. and see the view. That's and amazing. Up you go. Did you, did you design that? Yeah. Well, the I whole thing? Tower. Right, OK. Needs the spiral staircase. Well, this is weird. Hopefully the... This is weird. Whoa, the little gate. Oh, Sorry. look at that. Oh, what a spectacular view. And you can see the maze all laid out below us. So you can look down at the people yeah. who are struggling to solve the yes. maze. Yes. And we're only 14 feet off the ground. I know, but, but you, can, the you get the bird's eye view, don't you? It does. Oh, it's lovely. And you can see also the the gardens and the village. And also you can tell we're in the countryside because in each direction you're seeing the hills. Yes, it's green. Of, of the landscape. Beautiful. So we are truly a village of just 400 people. Is that it? Surrounded by square miles of English Dorset. And they know they've got a maze master in the middle of the village too. Well, it's the only maze in the village. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> as long as it stays that way. Oh, it's lovely. This is a, I mean, this central pivot here is a remarkable structure. Yes, this, is, this goes up on a pulley and then yeah. down to the crank. Yeah. And this was the, the original um, 19th century castings for the spiral staircase. But we added the uh, internal drum to make it light proof. Yes. So yes. that we can do you can play exciting with things inside. in the light inside. But it's lovely, even when you look down there, because of the mirrors, you get the feeling that there are lots of spiral staircases going up to lots of oh, yes. towers. It's, it's uh, brilliant, the use of mirrors. As a piece of sculpture, there's a few things more lovely than a, an intriguing bit of uh, 19th century spiral staircase casting. So here we are. We've enjoyed the view. And, uh, and now we're going down again, very now, carefully. And if, the, if we're having a party by now, you can see the quick exit, which will take us in where all the... Food and drink and... I wouldn't want to drink too much champagne before I went up and down the staircase, but yes. Oh, I don't know. We've never had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right. Right. Normally when you've solved the maze and reached the tower, yeah. you have the quick exit to where the party's being held. Yes. But you came in through the monkey gate. Yes, I want, to, I want you to tell me about the monkey, gate, the monkey gate, because that looks lovely. Yes, so you know, is it this way? No, this, this way, this way here. Oh, oh. 
<laughs> you, could, you could get lost. I'm glad you're with me. Now, the, you know the three monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil. No, 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 try this one. Ah, so, oh, there, there's the gate. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, it is a monkey puzzle gate. Yes, it's uh, themed on the subject of monkeys. Our youngest uh, wrote a poem about monkeys, and it came first out of 700 entries in a national <laughs> competition. And so to celebrate, we created this maze, and uh, this gate, and uh, our good friend Nigel it's Searle got, designed it. It's got the three monkeys on it. That's hear no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. That's yes? the idea. And I, I find amazing, because if you... Amazing. Everything's amazing about this. If, I, if you open it, yes. you actually shut off. You change the design. So yes, I do. thought I was in a pathway. I'm now in a dead end. Yes, you are. So if you have 12 of these, you can have a different design every day of the week. Yes. Fascinating, Which isn't is it? That really works. Now, why is it possible to create gates like this in this day and age? In the old days, you'd have an immense amount of welding. Yes. This was done using a sheet of steel, water jet cut. Wow. Therefore, we can have terribly thin cuts. Yes. It's totally smooth. It's immensely strong. Isn't that amazing what they can do? And it's do done now? very quickly and, using, and very cheaply. Keep using that word amazing, don't we? So you find a method of technology which makes it possible. Yes. And, and I'm lovely. really thrilled with this one because yeah. we've done over, over 100 maze gates on all sorts of subjects from creatures of the English countryside to, and you know, each one, each maze needs about a dozen do. different designs, you know, whatever, 19th century agricultural equipment and all sorts of things made in maze gates. Maybe we should exit through the gate. Let's go through the gate yeah. and lead on. So as you can see, Adrian really is the most amazing person. Well, until I see you again with another extraordinary life, though maybe not quite as literally amazing as this, have a wonderful time. And from me, bye-bye.